everyone. Um, nice to see you here, um, and uh, welcome to Research America's 2014 post-election briefing. On behalf of our board and staff and members, thank you for joining us today for what I know will be a very dynamic program. You're going to be hearing insights from uh, leaders who continue to be champions for research after their time in the Congress. And you'll be hearing from a special guest speaker and panelists who have worked with us um, on the Ask Your Candidates Voter Education Initiative and in ongoing advocacy year in, year out for medical research. I want to thank um, Research America's board member, oh, that's me, uh, Research America's program sponsor, uh, Alan Leshner, and the AAAS for hosting us today. Um, Alan actually is in Japan as we speak, but maybe we'll be weighing in electronically, which I hope you will do as well. Um, weigh in during the program, join us using hashtag RAElection14, you see it up there, and um, afterwards keep the conversation alive. So we have a very packed hour and a half for you. I want to start right away by welcoming David Hawkins to the stage. As the senior editor of Roll Call, David writes the Hawkins Here blog for Roll Call's website, along with a front page column every day. His aim is to provide penetrating, nonpartisan, forward-looking analysis of policies being formulated on Capitol Hill and delivering informed commentary about the people and politics driving the legislative debates. He's been a passionate Congress watcher at CQ Roll Call for almost two decades. Hawkins is a frequent guest, and you may have heard him, on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, Sirius XM's POTUS channel, and NPR. He offers analysis each Monday and Friday morning on NPR's Washington affiliate, affiliate WAMU, and once a week on Federal News Radio. We're really privileged to have you with us, David. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. I almost, I almost wore that shirt, so it's good that I did. <laughs> um, so thank you. I'm, my assignment this morning is to sort of set the macro stage uh, for what the election meant so that the people who uh, really know what's going on in, in the areas that are important to you can sort of focus down. Um, so I spent much, much of yesterday um, with the delightful task of reading the exit polls and trying to find my copy of past exit polls to try and sort of see what it all, what, what it meant from the voters' point of view. Um, and I think it's, it's a little bit more mixed than the conventional wisdom, um, but not much more mixed. So let me just dive right in and tell you what, what some of the stuff that I saw that's interesting. I mean, I think, that, I think the overall storyline of, of the midterm election, what it was supposed to be, probably was what it was, which was, that the, the public is continued, continues to be very discontented with, with the state of affairs in the country, and they decided to vote Republican um, and to, as a way to signal discontent with the president who was you know, the embodiment of their discontentment. 70% still see the economy as in terrible shape four years after the, four years after the great crash. 78% say they're worried that things are going to go downhill in the year ahead. Only three in 10 see the economy as improving, and so on and so on. So general discontent with, with the state of affairs nationally, also discontent with the state of affairs in, in the political system. Only 20% told the exit pollsters that they trust the government to do what's right all or most of the time. And Republicans won those voters by 17 points. Two thirds of them said the nation is headed in seriously off the wrong track, which is the uh, largest percent in a midterm election since 1990. Republicans won that group by 40 points. 55% said they disapproved of Obama's performance. So that's a 10-point swing in two years when he won election with essentially 54% of the vote. And, no surprise there, uh, the Obama disapprovers favored the GOP by 70 points. Now, that, all that having been said, only a, th only a third 
of the people who went into the polls said their main reason for showing up at the midterm was to vote against Obama. And uh, while 20%, 19% said they were actually showing up to show him support. So that 33% negative, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually interrupting my day to go to the midterm, to go to vote, only a third, only a third said they were going to vote against the president. And that's about where it was for the Bush six-year midterm um, and in 2010 when, of course, the Tea Party wave took over. So that's sort of, that lays the predicate for what I think most people who are watching cable TV or reading the papers think is, so what happened? But, but the exit polls also said some things, some, I think, pretty important pox on both your houses things. 59% um, said they are dissatisfied or angry, dissatisfied or angry with the Obama administration. 59% said the same thing about the Republican leadership in Congress. 54% said they had an unfavorable opinion of the Democratic Party. Amazingly, 54% said the same thing about the GOP. And in good news for the, for the president and his party, oh, oh, and almost half, one more of those, almost half, 40, something like 47% said the economy was the top issue that motivated people to go to the polls not voting for or against Obama, that was another one, but still, like 47% said, said the economy was the top issue that motivated them to go vote. That group split 46-46, voting Republican or Democrat for Congress. Pretty interesting, I think, that it's not, you know, it's, 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 there's plenty of blame to go around. Now, the good news for the, uh, for the Democrats and, and sort of the, the bigger government, uh, Government should be spending more for, on, uh, on butter and, and maybe guns too, crowd. 48% um, told, uh, told the exit pollsters that Obamacare had gone too far. 46 said it hadn't gone far enough. 49% say they support same-sex marriage. 48 oppose. A split. 53% support legal abortion. That's a 10-point favor. 53, 43 support versus opposition for legal abortion. Um, you know, again, looking at it, so, so these are cautionary tales for the Republicans, right? 58% say they see climate change as a serious problem. 63% say they think the current economic system does too much to favor the wealthy. So the, polls, you know, so the, the people continue to be as ambivalent as the rest of us, right? Um, so given those poll results, you'd think, so why did the president do quite so badly, and some, of, and some of it is the mechanics of politics. I really think that some of this was the mechanics of politics uh, and the, the vagaries of, of midterm elections, and to be honest, people like my kid. My kid, my 23-year-old kid voted, but really only because I got him out of bed and told him, you know, that we were going to go vote now on the way to work, <laughs> that we're, we're, we're going to work and we we're going to go vote on the way to work, because he just, you know, like, I don't want to drag my personal life into this too much, but he, he like many 23-year-olds, is just like, eh, mm -hmm. you know, I just don't, I, whatever. You know, nothing's gonna change, et cetera. So, and he, and he, it was, I got him to vote, so in that, in that sense, he's not emblematic. But the, but the decline in, in younger voters was crushing to the Democrats on Tuesday. Um, the Republicans, Hold on just one second. Yes. So, I mean, the, so my bottom line point is that the sort of Obama coalition, the coalition that he put together of younger people, people of color, uh, and single women, that was sort of his, that, that was his secret, pretty easy to make secret sauce that got him elected in 08 and 012 just didn't, didn't come out for him. Uh, people that, that were younger than 30, only 13% of them voted yesterday, uh, Tuesday. It was 19% two years ago. That's a pretty big drop. At the same time, people who are older than 65, which of course are sort of the core of the Republican base, 22% um, of them voted yesterday, uh, Tuesday, sorry, yet on Tuesday, believe it or not, only 16% of the older people voted in the last presidential election. So older people were more motivated, younger people significantly less motivated, and that helps explain the results. Uh, Non-whites. Uh, who, of course, as we all know, you know, that's where the population's growing, right? White population is staying the same. The African-American, Latino, and Asian populations are going up, up, up. 
Uh, African American population is staying pretty much the same, but but the Latino and Asian populations are of course soaring. Um, they slipped to 25% of the vote, which was actually more than any other previous midterm, but actually three points below what it was three years ago. So the population's going up, but 3% fewer of them showed up. And single women gave their, the war on women thing was a bust. Single women gave the party the smallest margin, just, um, just 20 points, in any exit poll going back to the, the late 80s. So they still won single women by 20 points, they usually do it much better than that. So uh, that's why, that's sort of mechanically why things weren't so great. Um, in terms of the year ahead, um, I'm sure you, many of us, had our TVs on at the office and we're trying to pay attention to, um, to Mitch McConnell. So that, so the, of course, the big line around Washington, which Mr. Mfume, I'm sure will, he, I hope he chuckles when he says, the big line is fear the turtle, right? It's not, it's not just the University of Maryland that we should fear, but Mitch McConnell's nickname to all of, to friends and foe alike is the turtle. The Lexington Herald Leader, the most liberal editorial page uh, in Kentucky, uh, only draws Mitch McConnell as a turtle. So just so you know, if you hear people, if you hear people sort of talking around the water cooler about what's the turtle gonna do now, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. So um, you may have watched Mitch McConnell yesterday. I, he, he, to me, was the more interesting performance than the president's of the two, the dueling news conferences because, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell is, is the new face in town. He now becomes the second most popular, the second most powerful uh, person in the country, arguably. Um, and it will be fascinating to see where he goes from here. Um, I think sort of the, the macro story, which may be if I'm repeating what you've already heard others say, that's probably because it's true, I hope, which is that Mitch McConnell, you know, having waited his entire life for this, uh, for this job, he now has one of the most difficult jobs that ex has existed in congressional leadership in some time. He has two years, really, two years, to, to repair a broken Republican Party, which is split between the confrontational conservatives and their avatars who are all running for president, Ted Cruz, Rand Paul, his frenemy Rand Paul, he, and he has to bring, he has to try and meld their interests and demands with the interests of no fewer than eight of his own, members of his own caucus, so that's, you know, eight out of 50, so that's a pretty sizable chunk, 15, 20 percent of his, of his caucus, who are going to be running for re-election in just two years. Yes, the 200, 2016 congressional campaign has begun. Eight of them are running uh, for re-election, or expected to run for re-election in states that Barack Obama carried at least once, and in most cases, twice. So they're gonna wanna go purple, presumably. They're gonna wanna get things done. They're gonna wanna, you know, their, their secret sauce is to prove that they can govern and they've gotten some things done. Ted Cruz uh, might not see it the same way. Uh, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be fascinating to watch. It's gonna be fascinating to watch what happens uh, in the next month when the president will issue this executive order on immigration, as he made clear yesterday, and it, and which Mitch McConnell described as the bloody sheet in front of the bowl of the Republicans. My own expectation is that the president will do this very quickly, maybe even next week, in hopes that, you know, the, the bile that he stirs up among the GOP will fade by the start of the new year. Um, it's a great time to live in Washington. It's a great time to do what we all do. And, uh, Thanks for having me. And, and, oh, do I get to take a question or two? No. Yes, no? I'm going to try. Anybody got a question? No? No questions. All right. I'm out. Thank you. <laughs>
active and engaged uh, group of researchers, science, scientists and uh, clinicians in Louisville associated with the university who now do a, a four-day program every year inviting in the community and um, when they can get them, they're elected officials. Um, none of the officials came this year because they're out campaigning, but it's really quite a vital program. So um, we're going to move on now uh, to hear from um, individuals not from Kentucky, but totally familiar with uh, the scene um, in the Congress. And between them, these gentlemen have, if uh, my math is right, 75 years combined experience in the Congress and afterwards in being outspoken advocates for research. So they all uh, began when they were legally able to run, I think, <laughs> you know, to come to that point. And if I could ask you gentlemen to come forward, and I'm going to introduce uh, our moderator. So Rebecca Adams, the associate editor of CQ HealthBeat, is our moderator for the discussion this morning. Rebecca and the HealthBeat team cover congressional action and regulatory action by agencies within DHHS. Rebecca has worked for CQ since 1998 and has also written freelance for the Washington Post and the New York Times. So take it away, Rebecca. And I didn't actually introduce our panel, but you can see them pictured above. Research America's Chair, the Honorable John Edward Porter. Our Vice Chair, the Honorable Michael Castle. Um, our Board Member, the Honorable Koizean Fume. And the Honorable Bart Gordon, joining us today to break the ties, he said in the back. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we have a fabulous panel here with lots of experience, and we really want to boil this down now to what does this mean for the priorities of, of groups that are represented in Research America? And I wanted to just throw it open um, with the larger House majority and the takeover of the Senate by the Republicans. What do you think this means for funding for, for uh, agencies like NIH and CDC. And I wondered, perhaps we want to start with Mr. Porter, who oversaw the doubling of the NIH budget during his time as Labor H subcommittee chairman. But I'd love for all of you to, to provide your thoughts on what you think this means. Rebecca, can I uh, start with what might happen this year? Yes. Because um, that's on everybody's minds. Um, if you've served as we have in Congress and just gone through a uh, election season and you're back in for a lame duck session, you are exhausted, your family hasn't seen you for months, you want to get out of here and have Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, and the holidays with uh, your loved ones. And so I think there's a big push to get things moved quickly in the, in the lame duck. Um, the uh, Hal Rogers, uh, Barbara Mikulski, uh, Mitch McConnell, um, all of them uh, want, to, want to see an omnibus if they can get one. And so uh, I think there'll be a big push, and it's happening right now with the staff. Uh, it will be happening if it hasn't already with the members, uh, defining down the issues and getting to the point where they can uh, split the differences, which is what they usually do when they have divided House and Senate, and, uh, and get some decisions made and, and get the thing off the deck. I think Mitch McConnell wants to start next year with a clean deck, uh, and I think that uh, an omnibus is the only way they can do that. Mm -hmm. Now, on the question of whether there's been an improvement, I, I think the Ebo Ebo Ebola uh, scare, and people are frightened of it, has led people to begin to connect the dots a little bit and understand that, uh, that if you don't invest in research, you don't get ways to handle things like that. Uh, and so I, I think there's a general feeling in the Congress having been out there and discussing things like Ebola and other uh, health problems. I think there's a general feeling in the next Congress that there will be a, a lot more uh, goodwill for addressing uh, medical research funding. The difficulty, of course, is 
uh, the uh, budget caps, <coughs> excuse me, both the Budget Control Act and sequester, and uh, can you get a waiver so you can get a little wiggle room to, to provide more funding? Uh, that's going to be more difficult. The bottom line on this is all of us have to impact the Hill like never before in the new Congress, educate the new members about what this all means, why it's important for the economy, for uh, economic growth, uh, for the uh, leadership that America provides in the world, which is slipping away. And uh, so our work, it seems to me, is cut out for us. But I think the general environment is better uh, in the new Congress than it has been in the past Congresses. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to contribute to that? Uh, let me just take a stab. You know, it's, it's an interesting time. The uh, federal deficit has a percentage of gross domestic product, I think, is around 2.7 percent. The lowest it's been maybe in about seven years or so. So you would expect that there's this growing uh, ability now to use more money. The fact of the matter, though, is that because of Social Security and the number of persons entering each year or so in the baby boom, the gap's going to continue to widen. So I think what we're going to see is nominal increases for NIH and all of the other research agencies that are part of that orbit. I do agree with uh, John, this whole Ebola scare has created a couple of things, um, not the least of which is the fact that the White House is probably going to ask for an additional $1 billion in funding. It will probably be emergency funding, so you don't have to have offsets in budget. Um, but it is the politics of Ebola which complicates things, and to the extent that lawmakers, uh, even with the nominal increases that might occur, to the extent that they understand that there's a direct tie back to research, we'll talk about what happens the year after that, or any time after that. So I, it's an interesting time right now, and uh, I couldn't agree more that this is the time to sort of press and remind lawmakers of the essential nature of research in terms of driving down health care cost over time and how it's a win-win situation. If you, if you take a, uh, if I can use the term, progressive look at things, uh, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I would agree with uh, both John and Gracie. I, I think they're, they're accurate in their descriptions of, of what may happen. Uh, Ebola is going to happen uh, in some way or another, uh, but it may happen independently of, of anything else. But it does, I think, focus uh, on the need for medical research or other problems out there that may even be greater to, than a bowl to Americans for all that matter. So that is something to focus on. I, I would like to just make a, a point in, in terms of uh, Mr. Hawking's comments. I, you know, I think this is a more Republican year than uh, has been analyzed yet. Uh, when you look at uh, states like uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, and Illinois electing Republican governors, uh, that, that's a little bit unusual. And I think often it comes down to the quality of the candidates. Uh, I'm from Delaware. We're badly out-registered uh, in, in Delaware. I'm a Republican. The Democrats have many more votes. But we elected a gentleman to, to the state treasurer who's going to be, I think, a, a superstar. He's got a lot of degrees. He's been in finance. He's elected uh, to be the, the state treasurer, not something that made national news, uh, but, but a person who you're going to probably hear about uh, in, in the future, Ken Simpler. And, uh, you know, that was a little bit un unexpected, I think. So even, even in states like that, that don't have a big, a big and the Democratic Senate was reelected, but not by huge margins. Uh, but there are a number of states like that uh, in which uh, things happened. And, and it's hard for me. I can't, uh, I think he explained very well why this may have happened. And I'm not sure I understand it. I don't think any of us really understand it all, but um, the, the bottom line is that uh, there was a movement out there, and, uh, and, and uh, a good part of it was uh, anti-Obama. Uh, uh, part of it was uh, anti uh, the impasse that uh, we see in Congress now. Um, and a lot of it is, is the individual candidates uh, in, in certain instances, how well they ran a campaign, what kind of a good candidate, were they good or bad, or whatever it may be. Uh, but it, it just seemed a little more Republican out there, and the pollsters were generally wrong. Um, they were off by several points um, in, in terms of their poll, just as they were before when they thought Republicans were going to do better. So I wonder about polling, particularly with, with cell phones and everything else now, if these pollsters really have a, their finger on that pulse anymore. But uh, I'm not the expert on that, but you know, it, it sort of concerns me. But I think as far as 
uh, research is concerned, I, I believe there is an understanding in both parties uh, about the need for both scientific research in general uh, and medical research in particular. But there's another element to it uh, for appeal to Republicans, and that is the, the job aspect of it um, and the educational aspect of it. Uh, we need to encourage people who are being educated in America from afar to stay in America, to be able to contribute uh, to what we are doing here. Um, good research does, uh, good research uh, funding does help uh, with employment opportunities uh, in, in our country as well as leading to scientific discoveries which, which can make a difference. So there's a lot of valid arguments for research. I'm sure the President is supportive of this uh, and, and hopefully uh, the Congress uh, would be. They're in, in the House of Representatives. Uh, I think that John Boehner, the, the Speaker, who I assume is going to be reelected. Uh, a speaker is, is, is a reasonable person. He does have to deal with a Tea Party group that wants to not fund much of anything, I guess. But, uh, but the bottom line is that I, I think he and his uh, lieutenants will try to do the right thing uh, as far as the future is concerned. I don't quite understand the, the new makeup of the, of the Senate uh, that well yet, uh, but hopefully that will happen there too. But I, I think you may see some increases. Don't expect doubling as we saw uh, a number of years ago, but uh, some increases uh, in terms uh, particularly of, of medical research, but uh, of scientific research in general in the next uh, uh, year or two years of, of this Congress. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me be the skunk at the wedding here. <laughs> uh, uh, I certainly agree with the optimism that my colleagues um, put forth. Uh, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I think uh, you've been out of Congress longer than I have and remember the better days, I think, a little bit better. Um, John, I, you know, I think there'd be a lot of folks that would like to see a continuing resolution, uh, but I think that the Democrats uh, will probably hold it hostage. Uh, to, uh, Mitch is going to have to give them a very good deal, otherwise they're going to say, okay, if it's so easy, you take care of it. You do the numbers and let the Republicans be fighting over numbers all spring rather than doing other things. Uh, so unless, uh, now that's the last thing Mitch wants to do, and he may throw the towel in. But I think you could be looking at a continuing resolution. So this morning, you know, like all of you, I'm glad to get the election over with. I want to see where the country's going. So I open up the papers. Wall Street Journal, four articles. GOP sets the path forward with, uh, after big win. Republicans' agenda takes shape. Uh, there's an editorial about, you know, you know, what they think should be a, a growth and reform Congress. Uh, there is a, a Boehner-McConnell op-ed that lays out what they're going to do. Uh, in the Post, you had several stories. Uh, and as I looked through those, you know, they gave maybe a couple of dozen specific things they wanted, they wanted to do. <clears throat> Nowhere did I see the word innovation, research, university. I did see education one time. Uh, they want to increase charter schools and do away with common core curriculum. Um, so that, to me, did not seem like an agenda uh, that was consistent with uh, what I think is important uh, for the country. Uh, and, I, and so I, I don't share this optimism and, and uh, hope, but not, but not the optimism. Um, and a part of it, if you look at Congress now, uh, and, and, and I'm, just for not to be partisan, but to be quicker, let me just make some general comments. Republicans, for example, really come in three pots. Uh, you have a number of Republicans, uh, sincerely, that feel that education, I mean, I mean that, that in, uh, research is important. However, it should be done in the private sector because if there is a, if, there's, if it's important research, then you can make a profit out of it. And so the private sector should do it. And they believe that, you know, sincerely. You have others, uh, another pot, that would say, Yes, there is a role for uh, government in some re basic research, but no, no pick it. You can't pick winners and losers. Don't get too far along there. And then uh, Lamar Alexander and some other uh, folks understand the importance. So then, okay, let's take a look at the Democrats. Well, by and large, most Democrats think that investment in, in education research is important, but they also think that hunger is a problem. Uh, and uh, they think that health care is a problem. And as Crazy said, you've got a limited budget. And so, you know, it's not 
You know, so now Democrats have to choose between their own children here, uh, which makes it more difficult. Um, so I think that's my pessimism, and now we can maybe talk later about how we deal with it, but uh, I just had to sort of get that out. <laughs> we're off to a good start here then. Uh, let me just follow up. Whether or not you think we're going to have a CR when the funding expires on December 11th or an omnibus, whether you, or not you think it's going to be maybe, maybe you should Maybe you should let folks know the difference between a omnibus and a continuing resolution. Yes, so. the continuing resolution would just continue the agency's funding as it has been um, through the rest of the fiscal year. The fiscal year started October 1st, and the omnibus would package all those 12 appropriations bills into one nice, neat package. And uh, certainly there's an interest among the appropriators in moving forward on an omnibus. We'll see if that actually happens or not. But one area... The range of priorities you know, yes. when you do that omnibus, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, but one area where there might be the potential for bipartisanship might be taxes. And we certainly, you know, every year we have this debate over tax extenders, the R&D tax credit. Uh, the Republicans have said that they want to move forward, whether or not it's this year or next year, on um, changing the medical device tax. So maybe we can talk about that. Maybe that might be an area where we might see some movement. I'm wondering if anybody has any thoughts about, about efforts to, um, to move forward on the R&D tax credit or or change the medical device tax, which is a 2.3% tax that is um, on the Very industry. briefly, I think they will not get to the tax extenders in the, in the lame duck. I think they'll kick them over to next year. Um, there's, just, there's just too much uh, effort to get the decks cleared. And uh, that's something that uh, they have, even though they expire, uh, they've kicked over after expiration before. And I think they'll do that again. Um, the uh, medical device tax, um, uh, I think that's got to be part of a, uh, of a larger negotiation. Uh, the president uh, needs those funds in the uh, ACA, um, and uh, they have to have some kind of a substitute, or I think he'd be very resistant to doing it. Um, so I, I think that's something, again, that's going to be over the next year. One would hope that we have a general uh, broad look at corporate taxes, uh, at, uh, at all the things that are happening with money being parked overseas, and they would sit down and say, we've got to do something about our corporate tra tax structure, with this, which is destroying us. And everybody, uh, I think, in, in uh, and uh, both sides would say, yeah, let's do something about that. That's a major place where they could get together. The details, of course, will be the problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to happen in the length of the session. I think what you'll see, they'll kick, kick this can over to next year. I agree with Bart. I think it's going to be a tough time coming up with permanent solutions because of basic ideology on a lot of this. And I think what we'll see is the uh, tax extenders bill renewed for a year. The R&D tax and the device tax, I don't think any of that's going to be made permanent. I think it's going to be a give and take. It'll be a bargaining chip back and forth. We need real tax reform. And so whether or not the appropriate committees are going to start that process and go forward remains to be seen. Two years is a short window. Um, and already many are geared up for the next election down the road. So this is going to be a year to year sort of situation in my opinion. I just don't think there's a lot of permanency that we're going to see in terms of legislation. I do believe, though, that uh, the Congress will likely extend the bill, uh, the tax extenders bill, uh, for another year after January 1st. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure that uh, they won't do it during the lame duck. There's a, there's a lot of feel for it. So I, I think the tax extenders, of all the, the tax type bills, the tax extenders are the one that I think most likely to happen uh, during this. Uh, uh, two to four week lane duck session they're about to have. I think the medical device tax will be uh, rescinded uh, next year at some point, and there's support for that in both the Republican and the, and the Democratic Party. So there's, I think, a reasonable 
chance that will happen. It does affect the impact revenue, so there's going to be offset issues that need to be dealt with, et cetera. Yes, I think uh, it's 30 million over 10 years for mm -hmm. one that you know, a lot of people are talking about. But you know, you got to make all those adjustments down the line too, but I think that will happen. Um, I also, on, on a broader basis, uh, believe that you're going to see corporate tax reform next year because of the inversion question as much as anything else. The whole fact these corporations are uh, fleeing America or leaving money uh, overseas now and want to join up with uh, some company over there that has uh, lower taxes than, than we do in America, and, uh, and we do have to address that. I mean, it's a problem. The American corporate tax rate is uh, much higher than, than most other countries, and that, that's, that's a significant problem. I'm not sure about any change as far as the personal income taxes are concerned. I think that's more, more marginal. And the other thing I would just say is, in, in terms of the future, I don't see the Affordable Care Act uh, going any place. Um, it is, in my judgment, uh, I think everybody understands that the, if there was a, a vote in the House and the Senate, if they could ever get it done, to, to rescind it altogether, the President would veto it. Um, so the only way anything is going to happen if they sit down and, and, and talk to each other and see if there are things that can be done uh, to make it uh, perhaps better that both parties uh, could, could agree upon. Um, but uh, there clearly will be that effort uh, am among Republicans uh, to probably uh, to rescind it. It may even happen, uh, and then the president would veto, and then they may have to sit down uh, and, and negotiate. And I would just hope, or even pray at this point, that uh, the White House is more receptive to dealing with Congress uh, than we live. I mean, this comes from Republicans and Democrats. The relations with uh, members of Congress has just not been good. Um, there's not been a lot of communication, and, and, it, and it's a problem. And it's a difficult problem, I, I understand. Uh, the Republican Party, uh, my party, has problems uh, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, Tea Party advocates who, who have stronger feelings about it than some other uh, Republicans uh, th themselves, but the bottom line is they've just got to get into a room and sit down and work out some of these differences. It's in the interest of the president uh, to have this country move forward. Uh, it's in the interest of Republicans uh, and Democrats who are still in Congress to have this country move forward. They saw this election. Uh, they saw what happened uh, to incumbents, uh, a little bit in both parties, particularly in the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think there's going to be a real feel that we have to try to work some of these things out. And I may be wrong about that, but I'm optimistic. Of course, Bart's the pessimist. He's going to—he's going to crap everything I said. <laughs> no, no. I just bless your heart. I wish you were still there. And uh, I think you got one thing right, and that is to pray. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess my quick crystal ball uh, in, in terms of the extenders—they'll um, probably make. You know, I think some will. Will be pu pushed over. You've got to keep in mind R and D will be the, in the best shape, but there's also a lot of energy credits there, and and you'll have a real fight between the fossil guys and the non-fossil guys on that. So that that could be a problem. The medical device, no question, it'll be one of the first things up. Uh, the problem, uh, and there'll be Democratic support for it. The problem is it's going to cost you money, mm -hmm. and so you got to offset it. Now, so there's good news and bad news. If you don't like the medical uh, uh, tax, uh, um, device tax, and it's going to go away. That's the good news. The bad news is they're going to get the low-hanging fruit to pay for it, which will probably be take you know money away from other things that you would like to get done. Uh, and that's going to be, and this idea that they're going to sit down and try to see, see what, what is best, how to make the Affordable Health Care Act better, uh, it's going to be you know, it's going to be what ways you can undermine it going, you know, the, the, the threshold with 30 uh, employees rather than 40 employees, the, the individual mandate, and those sorts of things. Uh, so that's going to be a, a, difficult, a, a difficult area. Um, but let me be optimistic. Well, and, and uh, <laughs> one more pessimistic, and then I'll be optimistic. And uh, <laughs> Kwahimi uh, mentioned that we've got um, two more years. No, we've got about seven months. Mm -hmm. But I mean, because once you get it past the August recess, mm -hmm. I mean, we could go up to the August recess, get some tax reform sort of outlined, and then and then come back. I'm afraid people will be beat up so much. Mm -hmm. So you really have to the August recess. However, um, uh, Mitch McConnell recognizes that in the next in 2016 there'll be 24 out of the 34 seats up that are Republican. Uh, I think he's going to like being majority leader, like to keep on being majority leader, <laughs> and to do that. Um, He's going to have to look like 
uh, that he wants to cooperate. And so, again, for those first few months, it is to the mm -hmm. president's benefit in terms of legacy. It's to Mitch McConnell's benefit in terms of maintaining a Republican majority in the Senate to try to work together. And so I think that he will find, um, uh, you know, again, he, he, he's going to have to come up and, and, and put forth this idea that you do away with affordable health care, and they'll vote on that. But they'll try to find some ways to, to go forward. Uh, in terms of tax reform, I think it's going to be very difficult. We can't even have the highest corporate tax in the world and continue to think that we're going to, you know, prosper. And, 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 but it's going to be hard to separate the corporate tax from the personal tax uh, and not do it all at once. Um, and that's going to be a hard nut, uh, but I think it will be a serious type of discussion. And I would hope they could, could get by. I would say it's less than 50-50, but it is, it's something that's going to be seriously discussed, and it, it might, get, might get accomplished. hope so. Mm -hmm. So given this very tight timetable that everyone's working on, and, and given the atmosphere in Congress, what do you think the best arguments are for advocates of research to bring to Congress? You know, we've seen criticism from Tom Coburn with the Waste Book pointing out things that he thinks are frivolous. Mary Madeline had a column about particular NIH studies that she thought were, were frivolous. So in this kind of atmosphere, what kind of, um, what kind of talking points do you think would be most effective in trying to generate more interest in supporting research? I think you should start with the skunk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, once again, and, and, and I, I, we can't just let the same old uh, universities, um, uh, medical groups, and folks that, that, that seem like they have a personal interest tell their story. You've got to be a part of it, and you can help frame it, but we've got to get the business community uh, involved. And uh, they have to help tell the story that you have to invest in research and education to create innovation, which then uh, results in new industries and products, which makes new jobs, which provides new taxes to invest more money into education research. They've got to be a part of that. Now, and they're for that. But uh, taxes and regulation, is, that, that those are their first two children. And, and they'll sign whatever letter, they'll agree with you on any, you know, about research. Uh, but until taxes and, and reduction of regulation is sort of out of the way, they're not going to put their um, uh, will to the, or their, their, their shoulder to the will. So we need to, you know, let's all work together for, for appropriate reduction in, in tax rates, appropriate reductions in regulations. And then hopefully we can then get the business community to go down to some of their stepchildren and, and help us uh, with the uh, research. Did you say that's the name of the first two children? <laughs> that's fine. I had to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, good, you've got six children, so you love right. <laughs> that. Bart's become almost an optimist here, I, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I tend to agree with him. I, I think if you had to list the advantages of, of uh, scientific research and, and medical research as a subset of that in, in particular, uh, it, it's very important for those of us who are advocates, and I, I am assuming that almost everybody in this audience is, that to understand exactly what all this means. Uh, and I'll make a plug for, for Research America and, and for Mary and, and her wonderful group who, who work with her. But there's a, a lot of material on that uh, website uh, in, in terms of the, the connection there. And if you take uh, you, you can take what you want, but uh, you can go back to, to polio or, or a lot of other diseases that have been either uh, conquered or almost conquered uh, because of uh, medical research which has gone on. Uh, there's just a lot of stories. There's a lot of human interest stories. I will tell you that any of us as members of Congress, when somebody came in to see us from uh, our constituents from home uh, and said they were suffering from a particular disease, there's probably nothing that tugged at our hearts more. Uh, and I think that most members of Congress are, are very willing with respect to medical research to try to help in that area. But it's also an economic producer. Um, it does produce jobs, which I mentioned earlier, uh, which, which is vitally important. It, it retains 
good researchers uh, in the United States of America. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there may be opportunities to, to solve problems they haven't even solved yet. Uh, there are those who believe that Alzheimer's, for example, may at some point be able to be uh, resolved. And maybe the basic research is done with government uh, funding, but uh, then goes on to the to those who can make money from it, and they figure it out uh, and, and, and go from there. But it's, it's, it, there, there's an essential, easy story to tell. It, 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 it's a very significant uh, message, uh, and it can't be left up entirely to the private sector. I mean, uh, NIH and, and other scientific uh, basic research done uh, by the federal government is vitally important uh, in order to help uh, in, in this area. And I think we need uh, to go out and, and tell that story. And, and developing the human interest stories, uh, somebody you know, uh, somebody in your family, whatever it may be, uh, who perhaps uh, has lived a better life or a longer life uh, because of uh, medical research is a is a is a wonderful story, and uh, you know, reaching out uh, not just to members of Congress, but their staffs, uh, or seeing them at home, or whatever it may be, can make a, a huge difference. I think as far as uh, the, the the future of uh, research in general, medical research in particular, and uh, I know that we uh, at Research America did a uh, a questionnaire that was sent out to, to candidates and. A, a substantial number of the candidates, what, more than 150 or something like that, uh, sent in answers to that, uh, most of which, uh, you know, pledged their support for this. Uh, so hopefully that could be cashed into making sure that we're taking care of that kind of funding as far as the future is concerned. And let me just interject. Do you think that the arguments differ by agency? Do you think that the, there are some arguments that you really should push forward for NIH and NSF and so forth? And what do you think the prospects are for each of the individual agencies as we're talking about this, you know, CDC versus... By age group, did you say? Well, by, by agency, do you think that um, the prospects for funding for, say, the CDC would be different than for NIH or for the National... Well, Institute? yeah, it, 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 and, and I would, I mean, John's on the appropriations, understands this better than I, but I, I would tell you that generally, it seems to me that those agency, that agency funding usually goes pretty much up and down uh, the same way, be it CDC, NIH, or any of the others. Um, and there's not a huge variance uh, there, but there may be. Maybe I'm not uh, completely knowledgeable about that. But um, uh, my, my sense is that uh, you know they, they sort of look at it collectively in the appropriations committees uh, and make the decision that they're going to you know increase funding you know, one way or another. Now, there, don't get me wrong, there are some. Uh, you know, there, there are some bills floating around to eliminate uh, agencies and, and other things that we have to, you know, be concerned about. Uh, but I think when it comes down to the actual funding, it, it'll stay somewhat um, in, in, in balance. I mean, the, 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 the NIH is usually the biggest focus, maybe CDC a little bit less so, but, but, um, but, but generally speaking, uh, if you're going to fund those things, I, I think they'll stay within some range of balance. Mm -hmm. But I when defer to those who may know much more than I. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned agencies that are under threat, it brought to mind ARC, which has gotten a lot of complaints among the House Republicans and seems to be a target there. So, um. Well, here's the thing. That's the prime example to your question because Andy Harris, mm -hmm. from my dear state, has decided <laughs> that ARC has been doing too many tap appropriations and not allowing money to go to the NIH. Well, it's a matter of philosophy and what side of the street you stand on. But I, that begs the question, should ARC stand alone or should it stand with the orbit? And I think all research organizations make out better when they stand together. It goes back to the Ben Franklin quote from last night that was mentioned that if we, we shall all hang to, together, we will all hang separately. So you don't want to break that combined push-up. Uh, and the other thing is that, going back to your original question about what, what's the argument, what's, what do we put forward, how do we convince people? They're a combination of things. <clears throat> First, you've got to, I think, in my opinion, remind people of where this country was before there were even research efforts. So where were we before Louis Pasteur developed through scientific research pasteurization of milk? We had all kinds of diseases. Where were we before Jonas Salk developed the vaccination to polio? Just a terrible situation. And then if you fast forward that to today, because I agree with what Mike is saying, then you've got to put a face on this so that people understand in their own congressional districts and senatorial uh, seats that 
they're actual people. It's, research is not some word that you paste on a wall. It's, it's not something that's way out in space. It's people who vote every day, people who are affected. And so I think the advocates have to paint the personal picture on research to the people who make the policy, because then they feel it a little differently. And then coming all the way forward, I, I want to go back to my original comment about Ebola. It becomes, I think, a perfect opportunity to point out what happens and what can happen when we're not doing what we ought to do in terms of research and the threat that it posed for this country and other nations around the world. And the politics of it notwithstanding, it cries out for research. And there's an argument there that you ought not be cutting funding. You ought to be trying to find a way to increase it. Just some of my thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. In terms of Ebola, though, does that in some ways complicate the argument that people are, are making? Is, does it make it more difficult? You know, the White House is, um, is asking for $6 billion in, in money for Ebola now. So does that make it more difficult for people to come and say, well, you still need to provide additional money for you know, various agencies? Well, I think you're going to, I'll let John respond. I think they're going to ask for one uh, instead of six, because they're not going to get six. Uh, and I think the one is going to be, as I said before, emergency funding, so there won't have to be an offset. I don't know if it complicates the problem, but I think it helps to strengthen the argument. Well, we talked uh, about uh, involving business. Uh, I can tell you through years of effort, uh, involving business on the medical research side has been absolutely crazily difficult. And you would think that this is the place where you're building a base of knowledge on which they build their products. Uh, it just, uh, it's been impossible. On the other hand, on the physical uh, science side, there has been a business involved, business people providing leadership. And my message on all of this is all research has to be working together to get this message to people about connecting the dots. And we need a national effort to get out there and educate people. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple if you just focus on it. How this all develops into discovery. Uh, and and uh, I think we can get some of the uh, groups to engage, some of the medical research groups to engage in, in a national effort. But that would be something that I would like to see us do. Let me say something about abstracts. We never talk about them. But I can tell you that the Citizens Against Government Waste or the Heritage Action people or whoever go through all those abstracts and try to find ones that don't sound other than silly. You would think scientists are very smart people. They would have an understanding that in writing an abstract, knowing that somebody's going to look at it who might not be favorable to uh, what they're trying to do, would say, here's why this is important to improved human health. All you have to do is write it in a little more detail. And uh, if I were uh, Francis or, um, or any of the heads of any of the agencies, I'd say, we're going to put your, your abstract through a grinder, and it better darn well connect to why human health is going to be improved. Otherwise, you get these, these, these chances to get on the media and undermine research by saying, oh, look at what we're wasting our money on. And uh, I just think that's a very important thing to do. You've got you to gotta eliminate the negatives to as much uh, extent as you can. Um, finally, social science research. Uh, I think in the new Congress, it is dead. Uh, I think it'll be cut out in, in, uh, in both the uh, medical research and in, in NSF. Um, it's been part of the Republican agenda, uh, and uh, I had a long talk with Andy Harris, who might be uh, the new uh, chairman of the Labor Age Committee in the House. Um, their whole thrust is get rid of social science research. It'll mean more money for uh, regular research. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think that uh, that's going to be one of their main uh, thrusts. Where's mind and, control? Yeah. We, can, we, can't, we, can't have, we can't have math control. Well, you, you can't have politicians making judgments about what's important in science. All That's right. the problem. Well, this has been great. I, I do want to bring in the audience a little bit. I'm hoping that you all can 
go to the mics. We have two mics here, and I'd love to entertain some questions from the audience. Go. Did Francis Collins' comments about Ebola uh, suggest to Republicans that the NIH has squandered all this additional research monies, or did it suggest to Republicans that more money is needed for NIH? I just talked. <laughs> There's only one other left here. So <laughs> Wait a minute. John's the expert. I'm going to defer to him uh, with respect to, to what the appropriators might be thinking. Uh, I'm not used to criticizing Francis in public, uh, but I think it was not terribly helpful. Uh, it was it may be picked up by the press in the wrong way that, that he meant it, uh, but. Uh, the message that he's trying to make is if we invest more in research, we're more likely to get results that can make a difference in people's lives and health. Um, so uh, I, think, I think it was unfortunate the way it was played, but uh, it is what it is. All right. And could you please identify yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Jeff Mervis with Science. This is for John and Bart and, and everyone. Everybody's been talking about getting back to regular order in terms of appropriations. And we were talking about it in terms of uh, you know, an omnibus versus a CR. But how likely is that to happen? And the reason I'm asking is how important is it uh, to have the new, who the new appropriation subcommittee chairs are if we're not going to ever have individual bills uh, it's certainly, it, you know, not in the next two years. Uh, where is that spending policy going to be made? And I wanted to get your thoughts. Is it going to be made from leadership? Is there going to be an opportunity to move individual, you know, language on individual bills? I realize that's sort of a broad question, but we've been dancing around it, and I wanted to get your thoughts on how important well, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. Uh, we're all House, former House members here, but uh, it's a Senate that's the problem. The, the House of Representatives has, generally speaking, uh, done their appropriation bills, uh, generally passed eventually their appropriation bills, and then things get into the Senate, uh, and then it sort of falls apart. Uh, and uh, I can tell you from uh, you know what I've been reading and even involved with with a, with a couple of groups. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to, to go to more regular order in the Senate. And, and part of that uh, is uh, the appropriation bills. The, the appropriation bill, you do a budget, but the appropriation bills are where the money is actually uh, appropriated, if, if you will. And there are separate categories uh, in, in various areas, um, you know, from the defense to uh, education to a variety of other subjects. Um, and when they're done, the old days, uh, when they were done, uh, the, the various committees would sit down and negotiate differences between the House and Senate and pass those bills. Uh, and that's the way you could uh, influence policy. Uh, as I think as Barty said earlier, you know, we, we, we may go to a continuing resolution for a little bit longer. Uh, they may go to an omnibus uh, bill at some point here, but uh, essentially, even an omnibus bill, even though that can have add-ons that are a little bit different than a continuing resolution, um, is, is probably going to be very similar to whatever has happened in, in, in the year before. Uh, and it's not a full look at, at the appropriations process. Uh, I, I think uh, and I hope that the Republicans are very serious about you know, getting it done, that it's returning the regular order, particularly in the appropriations process. Having said that, it takes uh, 60 votes to get anything done in, in, in the Senate, and you're going to have 53 or 4 uh, Republican votes. Uh, so that, that means the Democrats, if they wish, could bollocks things up just as Republicans have done for the last number of years now. Um, and, and that's a problematical as, as well. But uh, there's going to be a, a very strong effort, I believe, in, in the Senate, a lot of pressure on them uh, to try to go to a regular order in, in general, which will include, hopefully, more consideration of, of amendments from both sides of, of the aisle um, on regular legislation as, as, as well as the appropriation uh, process. But uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but that, that was one of the, the tenets that Republicans had out uh, who'd been already serving in, in the Senate in terms of uh, uh, their election process in, in this year. Jeff, you hit a hot button with me, so real, real quickly, um, we all lament the um, so-called gridlock that we see now. Uh, other than um, 
than reducing, I mean, other than uh, dealing with gerrymandering and potentially unlimited amounts of anonymous money uh, in Congress, there's nothing that is more important than going back to regular order uh, to get through gridlock. Uh, on the Science Committee, when I was chairman, we passed 151 bills and resolutions. Every one of them was bipartisan because we went through regular order for the ones of you, if, if you may not, you know, it's such, a, it's such an archaic uh, thing, you know, I mean, half of the members of Congress now, the Republicans have been here less than four years. They have no earthly idea what regular order is, which means simply you, you know, somebody, you have hearings in a subcommittee, uh, you form those hearings, you gather information, you write a bill, you, you have amendments, uh, you try to work out your differences, and then you go to the full committee. And then, and then you continue to let everybody have their, you know, a stake in the, in the bill. Uh, when we would get to the floor, our Republicans uh, would uh, oppose uh, their leadership because they were a part of putting this bill together. And until we get back to regular order where you have amendments, people become a part of the process, and you feel treated fairly, you know, that yes, you know, I, I, my amendment didn't pass, but I had a fair, you know, shot to do it. It's going to be hard uh, to get through gridlock. So the question is, you know, will the leadership um, uh, have the courage to do that? Uh, uh, our, the person that was the leader in the Senate didn't think that was a good idea before. And, uh, and I think, you know, Democrats paid a price for that. Uh, the difficulty you're going to have is that with close elections, when you're in the minority, uh, you always think you can get it back the next election. And the way to that is to not allow the majority to get anything done. So our leadership has, and I think will continue on both sides, will try, if they're in the minority, stop anything from getting done. And which means you get to a crisis point and then it's too late for regular order and, you, and the leadership cuts a deal, makes something go, goes forward. So I hope that regular order can be brought back. And, um, and so we'll, I'll join Mike in praying again for that. <laughs> I, think, I think there's a real danger to the party that will prevent things from getting done. I think the message out there in this election was, by God, we're sending you to Washington. You better get things done and work with people on the other side of the aisle. And we're going to be watching. And uh, I think that uh, going back to what has just happened for the last couple of years, uh, I think both parties would have to be very, very uh, careful that they don't put their head in a noose uh, and, and lose the gains that they've made. And, and if I may quote my favorite founder just one more time. After the signing of the Constitutional Convention, Ben Franklin wandered out onto the street, John, and there was a lady there that said, Mr. Franklin, please tell us, what type of government have you given us? And he said, it's a republic if you can keep it. And that's the real challenge, making people feel like they're part of the process, moving things forward, having the give and take under regular order that we had for so many years, uh, and then holding together a republic that functions on consensus and not on any dictatorial stance. And that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Remember Charlie that was, that was terrific. Remember thank you. Thank you all. Um, and I'm sure it stimulated some more questions for everybody. You'll have another chance to ask some questions uh, very shortly. So. Um, We'll ask you gentlemen to sit, sit down for the rest and uh, the rest of the program, but thank you. Great job. So um, I'm going to say very quickly just a few words about our voter education initiative, which Governor Castle referred to actually uh, uh, during his comments. And I want to start out by um, thanking the sponsors, many of whom are represented in the room today, for working with us on this initiative. The goal was to get 
and we've been doing this for many election cycles now, the goal is to get everyone who is running for Congress to say on the record what they would do if elected to assure that we will have medical progress, that we will have research and innovation continue as a priority in this country. So um, this year, uh, we did a lot of new types of outreach, including a, a selfie campaign and a lot of work through social media, and really ramped up media attention uh, in nationwide publications and broadcasts, and also in hometown newspapers um, all across the country and in extensively on social media. So that said, it is a heavy lift to get responses. We got 157 responses from all those who are running, including, as you can see, from third party candidates, none of whom were elected. None of those we heard from were elected. We're still, as you all know, some, there, there's some contested elections going on, so we're not sure of those who responded, how many are actually represented in our database now, but it's going to be between 55 and 60. And if you do the math, that's um, you know over 10% of the sitting members of Congress. And then we have ex uh, additional for senators who weren't running. We have many of them on the record from previous years. So the percentage goes up. But it's not the percentage we all want, ultimately, in order to assure that research and innovation are a top national priority. So we intend to continue this um, campaign in the next election cycle with your help and after we fully evaluate it, again, with your help. Now, I can tell you some of the things we've seen already we're um, happy to report on because I think they help us all be better advocates. There were some recurring themes that are listed out here. And I think it's interesting that there were no overtly anti-science responses. But there were calls for accountability and transparency. I'm going to illustrate that with just a few selected responses, just little um, tidbits from individuals that we've heard from, but I encourage you to look at the website, askyourcandidates.org, and look up those who uh, did succeed, especially, you want to look at those, um, to see you'll have the foundation for how to work with them. So here we have Senator-elect David Perdue. And a lot of people thought this race would be much closer than it was. Uh, but you can see among, and this is just a snippet, one portion of what he had to tell us. And he has said, and we've heard this so many times from some candidates and now sitting members, um, including some that have already um, taken office some time ago, that they feel that it's a mistake to rely on the government for medical progress that is more efficiently and quickly achieved with private sector investment. That doesn't mean he sees no role for federally supported research, but he does make this point quite clearly. Um, Senator Booker, who is an incumbent, but a new incumbent, as we all know, um, is truly speaking like a champion and one who uh, gets the message, has um, committed in, in uh, editorials and speaks uh, very often about the importance of the job generation, um, quality of investing in research, and about the federal agency support as well. Uh, the new senator from West Virginia, who of course have been in the House for a while, um, talks about uh, healthcare choices and patient-centered reform, and is uh, reform-minded. Um, not didn't speak to us anyway about the importance of the federal agencies um, conducting research, but I think uh, you can see here that there's basis for working with her. Now in Oklahoma, we have uh, Senator Langford 
Senator-elect Lankford, who was in the House. And uh, you can see here the emphasis he places on transparency and accountability. And also, uh, it was interesting to note that he's interested in the regulatory burden placed on applicants for federally funded research. And uh, Mr. Rubensberger of Maryland um, bringing out the global competitiveness point, as well as um, bringing it home for diseases that affect millions of Americans. And this reminds me here that many of the comments had to do with the personal story that Governor Castle was emphasizing earlier as well. Um, being able to say that I have cancer in my family or that uh, someone close to me has been affected by Alzheimer's comes through very often in these statements. And then the final one I'm going to show you um, this morning is Suzanne Bonamici in Oregon, who is a strong supporter for NIH and also for STEM education, as you can see here. So this, this is just a few of the responses we've received, but I really um, commend them to you as a source uh, for informing your advocacy and a springboard uh, for conversations um, that you're going to have with members of the new Congress, as well as perhaps in the lame duck. So to talk about what they plan to be doing in the next Congress, we have a panel joining us now. If those individuals would come up and join me um, on the stage. Ted, everybody, hello. I see you out there. Come on down. Um, we're going to have a little conversation uh, with individuals that I'm sure are, are known to many of you. Bill Andresen, the Associate Vice President of Federal Affairs at the University of Pennsylvania. Brent Del Monte, the Vice President of Federal Government Relations at BIO. Sue Nelson, Vice President of Federal Advocacy, the American Heart Association, and Ted Thompson, the relatively new CEO of the Parkinson's Action Network. So Sue, maybe um, we'll start with you. Yeah, why not? Um, what, what would you add to what you heard today so far? Sure. Um, so I'm a very practical person. My job is to increase funding for NIH. So my question is, how am I going to do that in the next year with this new situation? I see two tracks. Number one is the appropriations track, the traditional track. Um, of funding NIH, but and the second track, which I think is more intriguing and newer, are some of these individual bills mm -hmm. that have been introduced, mm -hmm. particularly the uh, Warren Hatch bill that adds funding to NIH over and above the level that's currently the current level. The other potential would be the 21st century cures, although I don't think funding is a big focus for them. I know there's other things we can do in the research arena that would be helpful. So let me analyze those two tracks. Track one is going to hit the budget buzzsaw. Um, what the Republicans are talking about actually doing a congressional budget this year. Uh, they're also talking about balancing the budget. They're talking about balanced budget amendments. And if that's the case, having been a budget committee staffer for many years, the easiest place to squeeze particularly if you're concerned about the next election, is discretionary spending, because nobody knows what it means. Easy to just lower the caps in order to balance the budget. Then they hand off to Labor HHS, and you've got perhaps in the Senate, Senator Moran as chair, mm -hmm. and he may love NIH, but what is he going to cut in order to pump up NIH, and is that something that is bipartisan? So that's track one. I think it's going to be a very difficult one. The second one, I think, is more promising, um, I, particularly the, the Warren Hatch bill, because it is bipartisan, because they're both pretty significant and powerful members in the Senate. And that, I think, probably from my perspective, that's where we may begin to focus a little bit more of our attention, um, particularly for our lobby day and other things, is taking a look at that measure. Okay. Now, does anybody want to be the skunk at Sue's pick? <laughs> Agree or disagree? Well, I would just say, and this is to build upon what Sue was just saying, two things. There's many ways to skin the cat in terms of 
advancing research in terms of uh, making major step forward, major steps forward towards finding new cures and treatments. And there is a challenge related to spending. Um, I would hope. Anybody, anybody holding on to their microphones or anything? Oh, whatever. Maybe it's mine. Sorry. I, I, I would hope that there is a consensus developing that uh, irrespective of what party you may find yourself in, that there is support for increased funding for the NIH. Um, I think people recognize, I hope they do, that um, it has to be done with a central repository, the federal government, uh, federal spending does uh, on this. And even if you are in favor of cutting spending overall, that does not mean that you do, cannot support an increase to the NIH. It's such a national treasure and it should be increased, but there are budgetary pressures. The one thing I want to build upon what Sue was saying is we are so, and I work for the for bio, biotechnology industry organization, and we represent the thousand companies in the United States trying to find cures and new treatments. And you know many of them, but the overwhelming majority are, are I don't want to call them moms and pops, but they are small companies surviving on venture capital. Sometimes they've gone public and, and, and they want and they are pushing the envelope when it comes to cures and treatments. And Chairman Fred Upton at the Energy and Commerce Committee, Representative Diane DeGette, also at that committee, said to us and said to the rest of the stakeholders in May that they want to work to find ways to incentivize new treatments and cures. And they said, you know, we're smart men and women up here at the committee, but you are also the smart people in the research community. You're the smart people in the patient community. You're the smart people in the manufacturing community. Give us your ideas on how and what we can do to help you advance cures and treatments. So we've been engaged in this process for six months now. We expect to see a draft in January, and Chairman Upton and Representative DeGette want to make this a bipartisan initiative that they move through the committee next year. And we are just so incredibly excited. We at BI are hopeful and that there will be increased funding for NIH, but we're also hopeful that on the other side there can be changes within the government to better incentivize the creation of new therapies and treatments. And we believe combining those two things, we are about to really make a major step forward. Brent, Brent, before we move on, what about your other children there, the tax and regulatory interests? The tax? Taxes and, and regu yeah. <coughs> regulatory climate. The other children we heard about in that <laughs> last panel. I'm more optimistic after hearing the members speak about the promise of accomplishing something on the, on the tax front. I really am. Bio, we are large, huge supporters of one provision which is permanent, the orphan drug tax credit. And we would hope that if and when they do any type of reform to the code, there's a recognition that in the last what, 30 years since it's been part of the code, the orphan drug tax credit as well as the orphan drug exclusivity has done tr dramatic things to increase research into orphan diseases. I, I believe the stat is in the preceding 10 years prior to the enactment of that, provision, there have been a handful of therapies developed for orphan diseases. In the last 30 years, there have been hundreds. It's worked tremendously. Um, and the R&D tax credit. We at BIO strongly support the R&D tax credit. We know Chairman Camp uh, is uh, interested in making it permanent. We strongly support that as well. If they get fall short of making it permanent and they extend it, well, uh, that's great. Two, we would certainly like to make it permanent. This is something that incentivizes manufacturers to undertake the billion or so dollars it takes to go from you know bench to bedside. So uh, we're very uh, optimistic there on the regulatory front. You know, we are we work closely with the NIH. We work closely with the FDA. We uh, our ears are open with them. Uh, I, I, we speak with at Bio, Dr. Collins and his staff. Frequently, we are so excited 
about the work he's doing and also the fact that he wants to play and wants the 21st Century Cures initiative to go forward. And Commissioner Hamburg at FDA, we uh, again are in contact frequently and they want to be a partner in 21st Century Cures. We hope that they are providing and we expect that they are providing their ideas to Chairman Upton and, and, Chair, uh, and, and, and Representative DeGette. And we are just, I, 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 I am optimistic for 2015. I am. I think that uh, uh, things can be accomplished. And again, I, I, I would like to commend Chairman Upton and Representative DeGette because they want to move on a bipartisan basis and they want to do real things to really benefit patients in America. And that's just excellent. Okay. Bill, you want to weigh in? On so, um, first, I want to thank Congressman Fume for quoting our founder, Penn's founder, Benjamin Franklin, a couple of times. We always uh, plug there. like that. Um, you know, I think there's potential good news and bad news. The good news is I think we, we may see some really good chairs and co-chairs of the Labor H uh, subcommittees for our needs. I think if, if Senator Moran is chair, I'm assuming that probably Senator Murray will be, the, will be ranking in the Senate. Congressman Dent from Pennsylvania has indicated that he wants to chair the Labor H subcommittee in the House. And the reason he says he wants to chair it is because he understands the importance of NIH to Pennsylvania and the country and wants to be helpful there. I assume Rosa DeLauro continues. Those are, they are all strong, really strong champions for NIH. That's the good news. The bad news, I think, is really what kind of what, what um, Sue laid out, which is uh, you know, the House has been unable to produce, even get a labor H bill out of subcommittee for the last few years because, um, for, well, for a variety of reasons, but I think in large measure it's because um, the, more, the Republicans, a lot of Republicans, view the labor H bill as a bank from which they can make withdrawals to fund the other programs that they want to spend, that they want to fund. The Republican caucus in the House and the Senate is going to be more conservative next year than it is this year. And I think we face, I'm skeptical that we can get to regular, that we can get to regular order and pass appropriations bills unless there is a, a real um, fundamental change in the way uh, the majority party views, in particular, the labor age bill. And, you know, and it, it's hard to cut that bill from, from a, uh, Democratic perspective, as one of his, the previous panel pointed out, there are a lot of programs in that labor aid bill that Democrats care deeply about yeah. and are not going to want to see passed. And it's going to, it become, well, it, I think it's almost impossible to find a member of Congress who will come out and say that they don't support biomedical research and they don't support NIH. One of the challenges we face is there aren't any, um, there aren't the John Porters and the Arlen Specters and the Connie Max and the people who will come to work every day to say, and to their staff, what are we going to do for NIH today? We, we don't have the champions today that we've had in the past. I think there's a potential to grow a new group of champions. I, I'm very encouraged by some of the, the bills that Sue talked about by Senators that Senator Warren and Hatch are talking about, Senator Durbin is supportive over on the House side. Congresswoman Eshoo has introduced the, um, the Durbin bill and, and others. Um, I think there's a growing recognition that biomedical research is important both for the economy and also to deal with some of the, the, the chronic diseases we face. But, you know, I, um, having been around and watched, this con watched Congress for the last few years, I'm very skeptical that we're going to see the kind of regular order, particularly for the Labor H bill, that um, you need to, to get the kind of money that we want to see for um, for NIH. Okay, uh, Ted, please um, pick it up from here, either for what you think is coming in the new Congress or what might happen now in the lame duck. Yeah, thank you, and I'll try not to be repetitive because I don't think yeah. anybody would disagree with a lot of what's been said. Um, you know, I'm going to take a little bit different take on it, and, and that is that uh, I think a lot of people wring their hands after an election like this. And uh, I remember 94, which was really the seismic shift, Democrats losing power for, for the first time in 40 years. And what's happened since then, of course, is the Republicans lose power, the Democrats lose power. the Repo And so I, th I think one change that really needs to happen in Congress for us to get any of these things done is for the majority to have some recognition that one day they will be in the minority. And they really need to you know, work cooperatively together because you know, the shoe's going to be on the other foot. 
And I think to that degree, uh, where some optimism exists with the new Senate majority, at least with what we're hearing from uh, Senator McConnell, is that he does want to make the Senate work. He wants to uh, allow an amendments process. He wants to get bills to the floor, uh, which I think most observers would suggest or would recognize has not happened a lot in the last couple of years and, and may have led to some of the problems in this recent election. Um, so, and I think I had one of my board members called me yesterday and asked me, you know, how does this affect 21st century cures, the election results? And I said, I think it actually enhances the chances of something comprehensive and substantive getting done because, you know, from a raw political standpoint, I think the Republicans uh, and, and McConnell in particular want to show that they can get something done. And I think Chairman Upton and Representative DeGette have been doing a terrific job working with, with all parties to come up with a bipartisan bill. Um, I mean, you, you, to talk to Mr. Upton, you know, there's nothing Republican, you know, or Democrat in what he's talking about. It's, it's how do we fix the system or how do we improve the system. Um, and, and the focus there is the patient. How do we make it work to get these things to the patient more quickly? So I think the 21st Century Cures could be a very bright spot in this Congress. Um, not everybody's going to agree with everything in there, but, you know, we've been active on it. Um, I'm on the American Brain Coalition uh, board, and, and they, t along with many others. But um, in terms of the funding, yeah, unless we can get back to regular order, uh, the types of substantive changes that we want probably won't happen, and it will have to be the, the Warren Hatch type approach. And but. And Senator Durbin was mentioned earlier, and, and Eshoo, and uh, there have been multitudes of proposals to enhance medical research, and it hasn't, none of them have gone anywhere yet for a variety of reasons. Um, again, I think the Republicans have a great opportunity to show a new side of the Republican Party, a modernized Republican Party, if, if they chose to really embrace and, uh, and work on uh, medical research funding. One thing that I do think may happen, and, and I think uh, Mr. Porter had mentioned this, where these abstracts come through, and they don't clearly draw the line to why research on a shrimp would actually benefit you know, humankind. And I agree, that line needs to be drawn. So, so I, but what I, where I would maybe expect some Republican activity uh, in a critical manner would be maybe greater oversight of these agencies and what they're funding and an attempt to get these agencies to truly focus their research efforts um, so that it's not just viewed as a shotgun approach, we're going to fund anything and everything and something good will come of it, but um, it, you know, I mean, that's a role Congress can play. We don't want them dictating the science, but I think the agencies, and I've recently been with two of the NIH agencies in the last week um, at, at some meetings, but I think the agencies are aware that they're going to have to make sure that what they're doing is for lack of a better word, you know, sellable to, to the Congress and the public. Right. So um, if you, if anyone would like to ask a question, we don't have a lot of time, but please go to one of the standing microphones. And while you're thinking about that, Sue, let me uh, get back to you here. Do you think um, a combination of regular order and enhanced scrutiny will work to our benefit? I don't know how regular order will help if there's no money. <laughs> we get that stack, gets back to the money. And there's no funding. That's why I think we have to consider the second track. The only way the second track will work, though, is if it's considered to be something of a piece of legislation that demonstrates that the Senate and the House can get something done. I mean, I'm cynical, but I'm going to view everything through the lens of 2016. And we have seven months to, or there's seven months potentially for the Senate to show they can actually produce something they can go If we could get NIH on that list of examples, if we could get the Warren Hatch bill, for example, on that list, they're both pretty well known individuals, I think we have a chance of getting more money for NIH. I think approach, first of all, consider the budget. If they do do a budget, consider how many poison pill amendments there will be on the budget on the Senate floor. Just, just think about 2016 and all the amendments Democrats will raise. It's a lot easier to play defense than offense. And that, that would be very difficult. So assuming we, but assuming we get a budget, look at the numbers that labor age is going to be dealing with. And if they, if they produce a bill that has cuts, for example, the Affordable Care Act, it will go nowhere. So I'm really, I'm really going to focus a lot more, and I, and I think the American Heart Association will, on looking at the second track 
and seeing, and I hope everybody would consider, seeing whether or not we could elevate and get this, this sort of bill on the list of something that could show that the, that the new uh, government can govern. Yeah. Okay. I, I would say two things in, yep. in total agreement. One of which is uh, we look forward to seeing that, that legislation referred to. If there's a way that we can go about being helpful to getting NIH the resources it needs, then, then count us in. The second thing is I do see a benefit of the appropriations process moving via a regular order. However, I, I would note two things. Regular order is both the responsibility of the majority and the minority. And you could point to both sides of the aisle. And the, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember coming out of college and working on the Hill for the first time and seeing all these bills move through the House and then through the Senate. It was, it was a wonderful thing. But what happened along the way, and again, this happened on both sides of the aisle, is whoever happened to be in the minor minority at the time, you ended up with, and I, I think objectively, it's good to give every member of the Senate and the House his and her opportunity to offer amendments. I love the House open rules for appropriations, and of course the Senate's the Senate. They, it's open by nature. But when you ultimately end up with members filing 120 amendments themselves, and you, know, and you end up with hundreds upon hundreds upon, intended to be either poison in nature or dilatory in nature, obstructionist in nature, then you have to question about whether or not it makes more sense to have some control of that process so you can deliver ultimately a, a bill. You need to ensure that the minority has the ability to have their say and their amendments and offer their ideas. But uh, you just have to be, everyone has to be uh, a little more rational as it relates to these pro, uh, to this <laughs> process. We're, we're getting to the point oh. that, fr frankly, I mean, not to be um, sarcastic, but it's like we don't really need a house here in the Senate for the work that they do. I mean, because if everything comes down to a deal that's cut at the last minute, you know, to keep the government open or to, to solve a problem, I mean, and I've, I've heard plenty of members grouse about this, that they don't have an opportunity to do their jobs. They got elected to represent the people to do, and I, I don't care if you're a hardcore conservative or a hardcore liberal, they're still, they're passionate, they got elected for a reason. But we've gotten to the point that the dysfunction is so bad, we kind of could do away with the House and Senate, just have McConnell and- You heard it here, <laughs> breaking news. I'm gonna bring in, um, it looks like we've got time for one question. Mylon, do you wanna ask something? Bill, uh, I wanna make sure you get a chance. Yeah, Mr. Anderson, when you suggested that um, <laughs> lawmakers could support both a balanced budget and more money for NIH. Isn't that like those of us in the advocacy community giving? I don't giving... recall saying that. I, I, oh, I'm sorry, I got the wrong one. I, 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 was, I, I just made the point that even if one wanted to balance the budget or cut spending overall, that by logic does not mean that they want to cut spending for NIH. They could take it out of elsewhere. I hope, and I do believe, I'm, I, but I do hope that most members, overwhelming percentages of the Senate and the House, believe that a national commitment to the NIH is an important thing to do and would support increases for NIH. And it just gets down to uh, some would like to see corresponding cuts elsewhere, while others may be more permissive in terms of not wanting to see cuts elsewhere. Okay, thanks. Bill, do you have any last words for us? We are going to... Yeah. Um, well, I I'll just say I, the most encouraging thing to me so far is the fact that Orrin Hatch is a co-sponsor with, with Senator Warren of, of this bill. I think, you know, there, the Durbin bill has a number of co-sponsors in the Senate. They're all Democrats. The, the, the fact that you now have one of the most prominent senior members of the Republican caucus in the Senate who is willing to go out and say, we have a problem, we need to fix it, uh, to me is encouraging. I hope that he can bring along a number of his Republican colleagues to uh, try to wrestle with this. Because it's not, frankly, it's not just a problem for NIH. There's, we're underfunding science and research mm -hmm. across the board. And my hope is that uh, we can find a bipartisan consensus to deal with, with what I think is a really serious problem that threatens our international competitiveness, our economy, our ability to create jobs, Congressman Gordon. Um, talked about the fact that he's, we're still looking for the word innovation in any of the um, agenda for the Congress. So I, anyway, so my my sort of my hope is that that we see a, a real a broad bipartisan consensus develop to deal with 
with a serious problem. And, and Go ahead, Sue. I think there is a consensus for The problem, as Congressman Gordon pointed out, is not on any budget side. It's on the list. I, I yeah. look at all the list of things that the Republicans want to accomplish over the next year. It's not there. We need to put it on the list. We need to make it on the list. We need to make this something that, that they believe can help them in 2016. And that's, I think, a good place to wrap up. To, you know, we all have a passion for research and innovation, for standing together proudly across the science enterprise. Um, but we've got to get going. It is, we've got our marching orders, if you will. Now the thing is we've got to march. You know, we've really got to get out there with lots and lots of voices working together so we'll end up with um, uh, not hanging together, but standing strong together and certainly not hanging separately. So I want to thank uh, the AAAS again. I want to thank my colleagues at Research America who have worked so hard today um, and throughout the last several months on our voter education initiative and who are spectacular advocates, everyone. And to our board members and to Mr. Gordon who had to leave, um, thank you for participating and to our panelists here and please join me in another round of applause.